get started. Greetings, everyone. Welcome to uh, the Don't Waste the COVID Crisis. Um, we've been running this for quite some time now. We're very excited to have uh, Professor Daniel DeCaro from, from Louisville with us today. Um, again, Daniel's going to speak for, for about 25 minutes or so, and then we're going to turn it over for a, for a discussion. The way the discussion will work, please put your questions and comments in the, the Q&A down at the bottom of your screen. When you do that, we'll, we'll then go ahead and, and, and moderate those and give those to, to Daniel. Um, this, this is part of a series that's hosted by the Center for Behavior Institutions and the Environment at Arizona State University and co-sponsored by the Resilience Alliance and the International Association for the Study of the Commons. Um, a little bit about uh, Daniel. So he did his PhD in social cognition at Miami University and then uh, did his postdoc at the uh, Vincent and Eleanor Ostrom workshop at Indiana University in Bloomington, where many of us are, are have ties to. He's uh, now at the University of Louisville in the Department of Urban and Public Affairs and the Department of Psychology and Brain Sciences. So Daniel is very much an interdisciplinary social scientist that studies uh, motivation and decision making, uh, particularly around governance and sustainability. Uh, without uh, further ado, uh, Daniel. Yeah, thank you. And thanks everyone for coming uh, to see this talk. I'm really excited to share this with you and also kind of have a discussion with you all. Okay, so I'll get, uh, make sure I share my screen here. Okay. Okay, so I'll go ahead and get started. Um, so I think all of us here are very interested in this question of how do we improve cooperation, especially now that we're dealing with a pandemic. And in the United States, the pandemic really highlights, highlights the importance of voluntary cooperation. So as you probably know, um, the US has had very weak enforcement of safety regulations, kind of relying on individual voluntary behavior and the action of states and state governors to a large extent. So it really highlights voluntary compliance in a, in a big way. So voluntary cooperation is actually the topic of a five-year NSF grant that I'm currently doing with Marco and Alan. Um, and what we're trying to do is to try to understand when and why democratic decision-making, enforcement, uh, and communication uh, will improve cooperation. And I've actually been developing humanistic rational choice theory as a behavioral theory to try to explain societal cooperation. So what I'm gonna to do today is give you a quick overview of humanistic rational choice theory and in the process share with you some of our prior work because that's gonna be relevant as I talk about what we're doing right now in a national survey dealing with uh, the US pandemic. So if you'd like to learn more about humanistic rational choice theory, I recommend you check out this chapter um, in, this, in the new handbook for the study of the commons. I'm gonna be giving you very, very brief highlights of the theory today. And if you'd like to see it applied to some specific societal cooperation uh, sort of dilemmas, I've actually applied it to several dilemmas that were reported in this book, which all of those were dealing with voluntary cooperation in particular. Okay, so humanistic rational choice theory is an integrative interdisciplinary theory of motivation and decision making. And what it tries to do is really integrate multiple perspectives and innovate on them to address some problems that they haven't really been able to address fully on them uh, on their own. So I start with Eleanor Ostrom's work on uh, trust and reciprocity. And I really start to add in a broader basis of, of uh, principles for human motivation, perception and decision making from a variety of different disciplines that are kind of in my background. And all of that is to try to understand better when and why people cooperate, but not only cooperate, also self-govern. So the starting point for humanistic rational choice theory is to realize that self-interest is actually driven by fundamental needs and more uh, diverse needs than is often recognized in rational choice theory. So let's first talk about what a fundamental need is. In order for something to be considered a fundamental need, it has to meet four criteria. First, it has to be essential to human health and well being. It has to be intrinsically desired and highly motivating. It needs to apply to all humans, even if it's culturally contextualized. And it needs to affect all levels of human cognition and behavior. 
so the gist is that it needs to fundamentally energize human agency to be considered um, a fundamental need. So let's take a look at rational choice theory. Um, it basically recognizes three primary uh, fundamental needs, a narrow concept of self-determination, economic welfare, and concern for security. And so if you take those, and those are your primary motivators as a human, it means that you're gonna tend to be very greedy. You're gonna be concerned for your personal um, control, security, and your own desires. And the end result is that you're not gonna really be very cooperative unless you're forced or enticed to cooperate by others, especially if you can gain more by being selfish. So this is the classic idea uh, of using carrots and sticks to force cooperation in society. So humanistic rational choice theory does recognize the importance of enticements and force. There's a place for that. You'll see here later, it's gonna be very important, um, but it recognizes a broader set of fundamental needs and that these needs actually um, constrain and balance out the sort of narrow sense of self-determination, security, um, and economic welfare needs that people have. So if we take a, a closer look at this, um, you can consider equity needs and belonging. Those needs will cause people to care about others in addition to themselves. The, Dan, uh, you're, people... you're, you're uh, buzzing in and out with your microphone. Oh, okay, thank you. There, that's better. I'll try to stay closer then. Um, yeah, so what I was saying was uh, the equity and belonging need will drive people to care about others in addition to themselves. Um, and then people are also concerned about uh, fair decision-making processes in institutions and governance. They also want to learn and um, try to solve problems that are really important in their lives. So when you consider these needs, they will actually intrinsically motivate people to try to solve societal dilemmas to the extent that they're able to do that when those dilemmas threaten those needs. And they will also drive voluntary cooperation. So that's the basic assumption um, that kind of gets everything started here. And I'm gonna kind of show you more of this today. Okay, so this is the framework that I use to understand the process of cooperation. So on the left-hand side, you can see that leaders and governance systems, they affect people's fundamental needs. And if those needs are properly satisfied, then it will start to trigger an internalization process in which people will, turn, will start to um, identify with those leaders and governance systems, and they'll start to intrinsically adopt those rules and norms and become intrinsically motivated to comply. And if they're successful in the beginning, then it'll lead to some initial levels of cooperation, which will help to build trust and also a sort of sense of group identity or self other merging, be kind of a technical term. When those things are in place properly, it will initiate cooperation. And if that cooperation uh, gets to a good start, um, it can start a positive feedback loop of trust and reciprocity. And then of course, all of that is gonna be contextualized so, for example, political ideology, cultural definitions of what uh, constitutes a fair and autonomy supportive way of governing, those things are going to affect people's evaluation of specific governance systems, but the same basic mechanisms are thought to be at play. Okay, so there's three basic motivational assumptions in, in humanistic rational choice theory. First, badly managed societal dilemmas undermine people's fundamental needs. And then because they are fundamental, it innately motivates people to try to solve the problem to satisfy their needs. And then governance systems that, that satisfy those needs will tend to improve cooperation. So then that naturally leads you to question, okay, well, what governance systems will satisfy people's fundamental needs? So the way that I have uh, tried to address that is to focus on uh, democracy and self-governance and trying to understand when and why democracy and self-governance processes emerge and how they satisfy needs or not and improve cooperation or not. And so here you can see Vincent and Eleanor Ostrom's um, sort of emphasis on, on democracy and society. So I'm sure all of you here are familiar with uh, Lynn's design principles for self-governance. And here I've highlighted the three that I'm gonna be talking about mostly today um, but really, when you have all of these factors in place, 
the idea is that it creates a social context in which people can begin to problem solve, make decisions together in a manageable, fair, and credible way that builds legitimacy, and in one in which they can enforce their agreements um, and their rules for solving the dilemma. And if they're able to do that, and they have these in place, it tends to help them to build trust, solidify those agreements, and establish this sort of like ongoing uh, process of reputation and uh, reciprocity that can support long-term cooperation. So that's the idea, and we've all seen a lot of research about those factors. Um, but what I've really been trying to focus on is how. And that's the reason I went to the workshop and started working with Lynn in the first place was explain psychologically and socially what is going on when these are in place. So the answer that I've come to so far is that these actually satisfy um, fundamental needs. And so if you look at democratic decision making, it will tend to satisfy needs for self-determination and procedural justice, which is fair decision making and self-competence as people begin to solve the problem collectively. Um, collective enforcement, when it's combined with this, will tend to um, generate a sense of security. And then you can look at equity needs. That's, that's fairly obvious there. And the idea is that if this uh, collective is successful in governing this problem, it will tend to build a sense of belonging. Like, hey, we're doing this together. I like these guys more than I thought I would. Um, and it'll address these economic welfare needs that these folks are trying to address in the first place. And then all of that will begin to trigger this process of rule internalization and group merging or identity and start this virtuous cycle of trust and reciprocity. Now, the flip side is that if the governance system is not effective, it will actually undermine these needs and it will create extrinsic motivations that work against you um, or create polarization, etc., where you don't see cooperation working out as well. So we did our first test of this, um, looking at voting and enforcement in a resource uh, dilemma experiment. And what we did was we had four participants uh, in a simulated foraging task uh, where they compete for some valuable economic resources. And we had four conditions. In the voted condition, uh, groups of participants could vote on rules to govern the resource. In the voted enforced condition, they could also enforce those rules with economic sanctions. And then we had two comparison conditions where the rules were imposed. And they did this experiment over three phases. So in the first phase, uh, there was no voting and enforcement. It was a free for all. After that, we introduced the manipulations for voting and enforcement. And then we removed enforcement capabilities specifically to look at voluntary cooperation. And we surveyed their motivations and perceptions immediately again, after they, yes. Excuse me, your, your mic is cutting in and out again, if you could. I think it's probably connectivity issue. I have okay. this issue sometimes when I teach, yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll just have to clarify, I guess, if there's questions, sorry. Um, so uh, immediately after they uh, voted, they did a survey measuring their perceptions and motivations. And then they did the survey again at the end of phase two. So here you can see how well they manage the resource. Higher bars means better sustainability of the resource and better cooperation. So one of the first things that you can see immediately is if you look at phase two and three, um, imposing rules and allowing them to enforce it did not improve cooperation. And these are 95 confidence intervals, so you can see it's not different. Um, but if you look at when they voted on rules and could enforce, you could see a very big improvement and it sustained itself long term uh, voluntarily after we, we removed enforcement. So you get the opposite effects of enforcement, but depending on whether they voted or didn't vote. Um, and then if you compare this to all the conditions, then you'll see that the imposed enforced condition was actually the worst condition. And that voting and enforcement was the best. After we analyzed all sorts of things going on, we came to the conclusion that what was happening is that voting legitimized the use of enforcement and enforcement protected these democratically chosen rules so that enforcement actually increased intrinsic motivation over time. And we actually measured that and showed that to be the case. So let's look at need satisfaction so we can think about this. Um, voting, we found improved perceptions of procedural justice and self-determination. So it satisfied those needs better than having rules imposed by the experimenter, basically. 
Um, and the combination of voting enforcement was the only condition to improve perceptions of security, rule acceptance, and group identity. And so you can see that on the left-hand column in all of those graphs there. So what I'm going to show you next is our predictors of their voluntary cooperation in phase three. And what we did is we used their phase two perceptions to predict their later phase three cooperation levels. And in general, what we found was that rule acceptance and their group identity accounted for 15% of the variance in their cooperation. And we were actually able to account for 59% of the variance overall with the model. I'm just showing you this model so you can see that there is data here. I don't want to like it's kind of complicated to go through everything. So I just want to kind of share it with you and we can talk about that more later in detail, um, but you can kind of see how we build a path model. Um, and the model um, suggested that this sort of pathway occurred that voting and enforcement um, increased their rule acceptance as we expected, increased their levels of group identity. And then those two things were predictive of their voluntary cooperation later on. So now I'm going to show you um, results looking at uh, the rule acceptance. So this is really addressing the question, why do they accept the rule? Okay, and what we found was that procedural, that voting and enforcement um, improved their perceptions of procedural justice and self-determination, made them feel more secure. They felt they were gonna earn more money with this process. It led them to internalize the rule more, which is this intrinsic motivation. And those factors together accounted for 47% of the variance in rule acceptance. Okay, so we recently replicated this experiment. This is a working paper that we're currently working on, um, looking at communication. <clears throat> and so what we did is we measured motivations, perceptions, and cooperation levels before, during, and after uh, group communication in a similar, in a, basically the same experimental setup. Um, so I'm gonna show you some highlights from that. So first of all, we sh showed, as I think pretty much everyone does, that communication improved cooperation. And so here you can see those results um, when they were cooperating and after they cooperated, we see a huge increase in their resource uh, sustainability. Oh, and I forgot to mention, we removed communication later in the experiment. So during phase three, there's no communication and they're now completely voluntarily complying with rules that they came up with earlier. Okay, um, the other thing we found is we coded the way they made their decisions and we created an uh, index of democratic decision making. And what we found was that groups that made decisions more democratically cooperated better and that negative social sanctions like shaming each other, uh, giving each other threats would backfire unless they were, uh, and when they were in these undemocratic groups. So you can see one example of this, this is just looking at rule acceptance. Um, and the reason I'm doing that is because this is one of our central predictors. And what you can see here is that, and I've circled it, is that these are groups that had an undemocratic process, but used a lot of negative social sanctions. It tended to backfire, whereas it didn't when they were in a democratic group. The same thing happened with, um, by the way, with their internalization and their cooperation. And of course, we found that needs played an important role in this. Much more complicated because the process is more complicated. Uh, but the gist is that we found that rule acceptance and procedural justice and self determination perceptions that were associated with the democratic decision making process accounted for 18% of the variance in their voluntary cooperation later in the experiment. And you can see how this broke down uh, below there where I show the percentages of these effects. And one of the things that you'll also see is that um, trust played a really important role in their cooperation. So we introduced a trust, me trust measure in this experiment um, that we didn't have in the other one. So then we asked the question, okay, why do they trust each other? Why is their rule acceptance increasing um, under these situations? So I'm gonna just show you an example of trust, the correlates that were associated with their trust levels um, for simplicity here. But what we found was that in democrat democratic groups, trust was higher. And uh, we think this is most likely due to increased perceptions of procedural justice, self-determination, rule acceptance, group merging, and the enhanced security that they get 
um, from the voting and I'm sorry, the democratic decision making and the enforcement. Um, and this, we were actually able to account for 88% of the variance in their um, trust levels. And this is um, also adjusting for the number of predictors. So now let's uh, apply these same sort of ideas to the US uh, gover governance of the pandemic in the United States. So I'll just go ahead and say up front, we, sound, we found basically the same sort of effects, but we're looking at these at national and state levels. Um, and political affiliation was a major factor, as you would imagine. And that's one of the reasons we did this study was to capture that within humanistic rational choice theory. Um, okay, so I'm gonna be showing you results from uh, about 770 participants today. This was taken from June 2nd to the 13th, which was during the first major national shutdown in the United States. Um, this was an online survey. We conducted it in six states, but I'm gonna be reporting four today. Um, California, Florida, New York, and Texas. These are our larger ones. Um, and this was actually part of a much larger study. So we haven't even begun to analyze all the data. This is just preliminary results. We did this using Qualtrics. Um, we purchased a survey panel and it ran about $4 per participant. We targeted 800 registered voters. We wanted 200 in each state and we wanted those uh, split uh, evenly between Republican and Democrats. Um, and this includes independents who are leaning one way or the other. The median age was about 53 years old, 81% um, white participants. Our largest uh, other group was 7% black. And uh, our measures indicated that these would be considered political moderates um, for the most part. So we had three different ways that we looked at cooperation. Um, we looked at their general compliance with common safety guidelines. We looked at their compliance specifically with President Trump and, and the Trump administration's safety guidelines. And we looked at those currently, which was during like most recent time and right now, their levels of compliance and their future plans to cooperate. So that's important to point out because the current is a self-report of compliance and the future is uh, what we would say is an attitude or a behavioral intention to comply. And we did the same for uh, their state governor and state administration. So here you can see an example of how we measured this. This is specifically for President Trump. Um, and this is the current compliance. Okay, so first we can look at compliance in general. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some of the effects and then I'm going to show you some regression models. Um, so what you can see here pretty quickly is that Republicans and Democrats, first of all, both reported high levels of cooperation in general. And remember, these are politically moderate respondents um, and Democrats were significantly but kind of slightly more cooperative in general. And this is out of a five point scale. Okay, now we can look at um, cooperation with President Trump. So um, on the left-hand side, you'll see Republicans. Uh, the first column is current and the second column is future cooperation. Um, and what you can quickly see is that Democrats reported being less likely to cooperate now and especially in the future with President Trump's safety guidelines. So one of the things I wanna point out about this is if you recall what the guidelines were at the time at the national level, they essentially didn't exist. It was basically, don't worry about it. Um, it's all gonna blow over. Uh, we're gonna leave it to states and individuals to kind of comply and we're gonna make recommendations, but we're not necessarily going to enforce behavior. So if you have that viewpoint, then you can, you can kind of see uh, why uh, Democrats would be less likely to say they wanna comply with those gu guidelines than Republicans would. The other thing I wanna point out, because this is gonna be important in a minute, is there's an important match here. So Republicans were more likely to cooperate with the Republican leader and governance system, and Democrats were more likely to cooperate with, um, well, you'll see in a minute, Democratic leaders. Okay, so um, now what I'm gonna show you is cooperation with the state governor. And now it's a little bit confusing, so I wanna point this out. Now we're not talking about future versus current, um, I'll do that in a minute. We're looking specifically at current right now, and we're looking at whether there was a match or a mismatch 
between the political ideology of the participant and the governor. So if you look at the Democrats, um, you can see the, the first blue column there is when uh, they're in a state that has a Democratic governor and they are also themselves a Democrat. And what you can see is that they're more likely to comply with the Democratic governor and that they're less likely to comply with a Republican governor. So that's one thing. The other thing I want to point out is that it's still pretty good levels of, of compliance, at least self-report here, and in, uh, um, because three is the neutral point. So they're saying that they would comply. But there is a difference here based on the match or the mismatch uh, of perception there. And we saw the same pattern for their future cooperation, except it was about doubly strong. It was much stronger, which makes sense because the current situation kind of forced cooperation among everybody and they might cooperate with someone and do certain things they wouldn't necessarily want to do at that time because of you know kind of the nature of what was happening. But they're saying in the future, I wouldn't do this as much, especially the Democrats. Okay, so we can start to look at need satisfaction. Um, so as you would expect, uh, Republicans perceive President Trump as uh, somewhat fair and autonomy supportive. So they see President Trump as satisfying procedural justice needs and self-determination needs much more than Democrats. And actually, if you look at the Democrats, this is in the negative area. So what they're really saying is that they perceive President Trump and the administration as coercive and undemocratic. So the way we measured that is we had um, a few tables of these different items, which are taken from standard measures of procedural justice and self-determination that have been widely used um, and that I've also been adapting over the past several years for use in social dilemmas. So uh, one thing I want to import one important thing I want to point out here is that we saw the exact same patterns for perceptions of security, belonging, competence, acceptance, and internalization. And I'm, I'm going to highlight internalization because that's the predictor I'm going to show you all in a minute. And the reason for that is that this is talking about intrinsic motivation, and intrinsic motivation is extremely important for voluntary behavior. Um, and also, acceptance and internalization were highly correlated. So basically when they say, I accept the rule, they're saying I intrinsically accept the rule or not. Uh, also um, older adults, women, um, and in particular um, participants who identified as black or Chinese, they were less likely to feel that their needs were being satisfied by the Trump administration and they were uh, less internalized and less accepting. So this is the reason, uh, this effect that I just showed you is the reason why humanistic rational choice theory has this component to the model, is to recognize that even though the same basic motivational process is occurring, needs still matter and they still affect internalization, et cetera, that it depends on the perceptions of the individual. The two different individuals with different political ideologies, uh, other characteristics in different situations, um, will perceive the exact same governance system differently. And that's very important because a lot of research does not pay attention to that fact. So I'm going to show you some highlights here and then I'll be just about done. Um, so these are very, very simplified models and we're going to make these much more complicated in the future. Um, but this kind of communicates the idea. So first we can look at um, their intrinsic motivation. And what we found was that people's internalization of uh, the safety guidelines that the Trump administration had were strong predictors of uh, their self-reported current cooperation and their future cooperation. So you can see that um, intrinsic motivation or internalization is accounting for 30% of the variance for current cooperation and 48% of the variance for future cooperation. <clears throat> so this is how we measured it. We had three indicators. Um, for this particular item or measure. So we had one item looking at compliance because they think that uh, the guidelines will keep them safer. Um, one say looking at whether they felt that these were important safety guidelines to have and the extent to which the Trump administration's guidelines match, match their personal uh, desires and values. So these are all different dimensions of intrinsicness. And you can see an example of how this is measured here 
um, for the safety component. And these are adapted from standard measures that are used in other domains that I've been kind of working on uh, in social dilemmas. Okay, so now we can we can start to think about um, what are the correlates of internalization. So again, why are people intrinsically motivated or not in this case? Um, and what we we concluded so far is that uh, political party affiliation plays a big role in what uh, type of intrinsic motivations people have about this issue. Actually, accounted for thirty one percent of the variance, um, and then their perceptions of procedural justice and self determination, which again were dependent on their political party. <clears throat> okay, so that's that's the gist of what I was going to show about these results, and I can talk about a whole lot more uh, things, but that kind of gives you the overview. So I thought I would talk a little bit about the implications of what the research I've been doing kind of suggests to me about the situation. Um, so first of all, humanistic rational choice theory, it's making this claim that rational agents will cooperate to satisfy fundamental needs. And therefore, governance systems that satisfy these needs are typically going to improve cooperation. So if we apply that to the US pandemic, and we think about the results that I showed in the communication experiment, and I also showed in the voting and enforcement experiment, um, then we can, we can think about the fact that democratic decision-making processes and enforcement work well together, and they don't seem to work uh, well apart. And so this would lead me to assume that uh, we need to see not only better democratic process for both sides, uh, of the polarization here, but we also need to see the important rules enforced. So for those of you that are familiar with Lynn and Vincent's work, um, I mean, it's pretty obvious, they've said this many, many times in their work, that uh, people in self-governing societies should be willing to enforce the rules that they care about in order to achieve mutually beneficial outcomes, and that these two things work well together. Um, and so I'll just point out, you know, the U.S. has a history of enforcing public health laws like uh, smoking laws in public areas, reducing speeding on highways, et cetera, for the public good. So why can't we see them, the U.S. do the same thing for the pandemic? And so what I would just say is that um, it is due to political polarization, but also um, a collection of social and cognitive biases. And so I, I've been doing some work in adaptive environmental governance that I think is relevant here, where I've talked about um, the need for tolerance for um, uncertainty, uh, the need to understand how adaptive governance processes work, they're not always linear, and that you need to create systems to build trust. So I talk about barriers to that. So this, these are cognitive barriers like loss aversion um, and uh, political framing, et cetera, that sort of cloud people's judgment. And I think they're at play here. The other uh, lesson that I kind of get from this is that, you know, we obviously need some form of adaptive governance. And I would suggest based off of the work of the Ostroms, it needs to be polycentric. It needs to be as self-governing as possible. Um, and as I talked about before, you know, democracy is seen as a process for problem solving in complex societies. Um, and indeed, you know, the U.S. government is designed as a polycentric system of self-governance. And the question that I just pose in looking at this is why has the federal government abandoned its role in facilitating cooperation in society around this issue? And that raised me to this question to think, okay, well, what is the proper role of federal, state, local government, and the people? Because right now, a lot of the responsibility and action is being placed on the shoulders of the states, local governments, and regular people in the population, which is good, but there's a missing component at the top. And really what I think needs to be done is um, we need to have coordinated action that is facilitated by federal government. An example of that would be when we had the shortage of, of uh, ventilators, for example, in the beginning of the pandemic, the federal government really, in my opinion, should have jumped in and started to coordinate that very heavily start to regulate use so that states and cities weren't competing for access in bidding wars, for example. Um, that's kind of the whole purpose of having a federal government is to set the tone for that, to coordinate that, and enforce things at a larger scale so that the states can cooperate better. <clears throat> 
And so as I've been thinking about the pandemic, my mind keeps coming back to some of these quotes from Vincent's work um, where he says, you know, federalism, it's not just a form of government. It's a method for solving problems. It's a way of life. And in fact, it's his view of complex self-governance and democracy in society, um, which the way I interpret that is his view of how to satisfy fundamental needs to yield a cooperation and um, communication that yields agreements that can solve these kinds of problems. And so you can see him talking about multiple centers of governance activity in society, self-governing themselves and working together in these sort of uh, networks of governance to solve complex problems like we see today. So I've been doing some work um, thinking about design principles for uh, polycentricity and uh, working out of the framework or the concept of state reinforced self-governance. And so I think that those principles can be useful here I'm not going to go in, into them at this time, but if we want to talk about them, we can. Um, but the idea is certain components of the way that institutions are designed that can uh, provide authority, responsibility, um, operational resources, et cetera, for these different centers of activity to um, do the ad adaptation that they kind of need to do. And I see a direct link between those factors and the, need, and the ability to satisfy fundamental needs in a dilemma like this. So I'm going to start to, in the future, think about how these could apply to those sort of systems. And that, that kind of makes me want to think about um, good examples of adaptive governance around this issue. And it'd be interesting to hear if, if you all have any thoughts on that. So that's, that's where I'll leave it off. That's my talk. Um, and I'm happy to uh, discuss any questions you might have. Great, Dan, thanks very much. That was uh, very enlightening. And, and I, I very much like how you took the experimental results from your earlier work and then applied them in this, uh, what's, what's uh, this practical application that's of interest to, I think, virtually everyone on the planet. Yeah. <laughs> um, at, at this point. Um, so again, if you have questions, go ahead and put them in the Q&A and, and I'll start to, to uh, queue those up for, for, for Dan. And, while, while people are, are thinking and, and typing away, I, I had a couple questions for you. Um, and I'm thinking back to the conceptual model that you had um, that, that led, uh, you know, if we, were, if we had a virtuous cycle, we were getting towards, uh, we were leading to more cooperation. And I'm wondering, given the, uh, the current dynamics in, in the US and, and in the lead up to this election, the 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 negative uh, version of that then um, self determination um, degenerating into into anarchy. You know, if I have if I have my needs want uh, if I have my needs fulfilled, you know, forget everybody else. I'm out. Uh, you know, it seems like that has taken hold in some parts of society. Do you, did you see this in the data for the pandemic or? Yeah, um, yeah, I have another component to the survey that I didn't share with you that's addressing that specific question. Um, and I've also seen this in the lab. And so what I would say is that the role of government in any context is to help the competing actors who are in different positions in society to start to work together so that they don't try to satisfy their own needs in a narrow sense, but try to satisfy their needs collectively. Because there's these individual fundamental needs, but they also exist at a collective level. And if you don't have government coming in, helping people sort through that, then they'll perceive less security and they'll start to feel less control and they'll start to feel less belonging and they'll vilify the others. And then they'll say, I'm gonna do whatever it takes so that I can get my needs met. And then you start to see the darker side of self-interest emerge. And so that I think has been what has been really lacking in the federal government's response here is to help uh, folks on different sides of this issue work together to satisfy each other's needs mutually. Because I think that's what that has to occur. We see that in river compacts that they'll tend, if they work well, they'll find a solution that seems to satisfy everyone's kind of self-interest in a way. Um, but we see this in the lab as well. So in the voting and enforcement experiment, I've been trying to think what's the closest analog to what we see in society. And I, I think that what we're seeing in society right now in the US is similar to the voted condition or the imposed condition. 
uh, which kind of saw moderate levels of cooperation. It wasn't as good as voting and enforcement, but it wasn't as bad as imposed rules and enforcement. And the reason was, was that, for example, in the voted condition, half of the people got a rule that they wanted and the other half didn't. So half won the vote and half lost the vote. The ones that won the vote, they cooperated intrinsically and the ones that didn't pillage the resource. And so without enforcement to stop them from pillaging, uh, they just continue to pillage and you got these moderate levels of cooperation. And so I think that's what you're kind of seeing in the U.S. right now is that half the group, half of the population sees this need for the safety regulations, et cetera, um, as legitimate and justified. And they're trying to comply. And the other half, not so much. Um, yeah. And did you see differences um, across the, the six states that you looked at? So uh, yes, we haven't gotten to analyze it in full detail. One of the things that happens is there are so many factors that we're gonna be bringing into this that it starts to decrease your sample size at the state level. So we're trying to figure out what's the best way to account for that without, you know, to keep, still have reliable data. But one example that I'll say is, so we had Kentucky in there and we had Michigan in there. Um, the reason I didn't report them today was for two reasons. One, the primary reason was that we were able to collect all of the data from the four other states almost instantaneously in like the first three to four days. And then it trickled in a little bit over the next week. With Kentucky and Michigan, it took a full month. And what we ended up with was actually multiple cohorts from those states and they were the effects were changing over time. But one of the things that I noticed was that in Kentucky and Michigan, you know, I showed you the polarization effect where there was like a mismatch between governor and the participant. And that was actually much stronger in um, Michigan, for example, if I recall correctly. So what, what I mean is Michigan has a, a, a um, Democrat governor and Republicans were far less likely to wanna to cooperate in that state than we saw in say California where the, the cooperation was still pretty good. Um, so, so there was that sort of thing going on and I need to dig into the details more. It's gonna take a while. That's, that's uh, fascinating. Um, I'm, let me see what what we have here in the in the chat. So Candace brings up an example of adaptive governance, and she's uh, talking about uh, school districts and how um, they're changing policy on the fly based on how how caseloads are are changing. That's um, interesting. Our governor has done that too. Actually, set up a reporting system where. Um, schools are encouraged to report uh, every week, cases, et cetera. And then th that gets published online so that everyone can see it in the state. And then um, supposed to be helping facilitate conversation with each school and the parents there so they can decide on a school by school basis whether they wanna continue for the next week or not. If a threshold is reached where a certain level of cases occurs in that state or uh, that county and school, then, um, they're supposed to shut down for X number of time until it comes back. So they, they built in this sort of like adaptive feedback process to figure it out. The question that I have for that is, to what extent is the democratic process around that decision making that's occurring at that level? Is it satisfying needs appropriately? Um, th that to me is important with the compliance part. Right, I know that um, I've had those discussions with with Forest Service employees in the past where they talk about um, an adaptive management or adaptive governance approach. And what they really mean is that they uh, change uh, what they do occasionally, but it, mm -hmm. it may not be very clear on why they're changing. And so we were yeah. pushing for them to say, these are decision points. You know, if this happens, then we make a decision. If it If it's changing, you know, favorably, then we act in this way, if it's changing, for the worst we act in this other way, but they very much said, well, we we're just changing. And so I wonder if <laughs> that seems to fit quite nicely with what you were, uh, what, what you were, um, saying here, right. That yeah. if, if it's, if it's not clear, if it seems capricious, then, uh, then we have problems. Uh, yes. So we have a, a question here from, uh, from Dane who says in the past, we may have said that the president's role is to coordinate at the national level. In recent presidencies, this has not been the case. Uh, what have you been learning about the role of coordination at different scales? Um, and what do you think will lead to more cooperation at the national scale? 
Boy, that is a challenging question. I mean, we talk about this constantly in all my classes and all my research. I'm not sure that I have like a like a fully solidified solution to that at this point. I have some ideas and principles I'm thinking about, so we can kind of talk about that. Um, yeah, I sort of laid out my thought process on that, which is that each of these different scales have important roles to play uh, in the process, and that if one doesn't do the role, then the others have a much harder time cooperating. So the primary justification around having a federal government with the power to enforce um, activities on states is in order to avoid the sort of factionalization that you will see between states. Um, that was very deliberate on the part of the founders. You can see that in the Federalist Papers as they discuss throughout history how the absence of that has led to um, a lot of problems. So the take that I take on that is, I look at this from this concept of state reinforced self-governance, which is the notion that um, the role of government is to establish some basic ground rules and enforce basic ground rules that focus on um, cooperation and adaptation. So in terms of adaptation, what I would say for um, federal government and even state government is you'd be thinking about what actors and what collections of actors need to work together in order to solve this problem. So for example, you could think about regional governance. So at one point, because the federal government was so lax here, a whole bunch of regional mayors um, in the West and East Coast, they started coordinating uh, their supplies and started communicating um, case levels, et cetera. And they formed their own sort of informal cooperative network to solve that problem. Well, so what I'm saying is the federal government should come in and say, hey, I think it would be a really great idea for us to form regional cooperatives around this. Let me give you some funding for that. Let me pass some bills to give you some authority to do that. Let me also assign you responsibility so that if you don't do it, you're going to get enforced upon. Um, and let's also ensure that you have some mechanisms for flexibility to do this. So that's how I kind of see it playing out. And that would be sort of nested and you would see that occur at all levels. So I start to think about, is there proper authority in place? Um, is that being backed by the proper um, federal institutions, et cetera? So that's one part, that's the formal side of things. The informal side of things is that every governance system is really a social construct. It exists on paper to some extent, but when people practice it, that's the real government and they will appeal to the written thing and interpret it. But in reality, the actions and the interpretations that people do, that is the government or the government system. And so social norms play a huge role in that. And we do not see federal government right now, in particular, President Trump, really doing a great job of setting out social norms and expectations about, okay, let's take this seriously. We do need to work together. Um, this is actually a problem of all of us, not just of, of Democrats or Republicans. And that would go a long way, I think, to helping the system that we have operate better. Um, that's just sort of my quick sort of response. Thanks, thanks, Dan. And so Marty has a question uh, going back to, to this uh, feedback pic picture um, and asks, what is the goal and how is the output measured? Okay, so, you know, as a researcher, um, I'm trying to understand cooperation levels. So that's one thing. And I'm also looking at sort of these indicators, the perceptions that are going, that are changing over time. You could think of plus or minus in different cycles. And this would actually play out, um, I don't know the exact scale, but let's say in our communication experiment, they were communicating over three rounds. Um, and so at a minimum, you'd have three rounds of this, but I think it's actually the cycles are happening more rapidly during a given round based off of important events that occur. So for example, we coded how many de decision events they had during every communication period. And we coded sort of who made those decisions, what were outcomes, et cetera. Um, so that's one part. The other part is I would say in a system like this, it's the goals are up to the people to decide in a certain way. So in the communication experiments, for example, we didn't give them a goal. We just said, here's, here's the resource system you all are gonna earn money off of how much you individually collect and that's it. And then when we gave them communication, we said, you can communicate if you want, you have that opportunity. Um, we didn't tell them to communicate. We didn't tell them what they should do. And so we actually looked to see, okay, did they even want to solve this problem? How did they define the problem? They might say, in which they did, some people said, this is going great because I'm getting a lot of tokens. Um, and then, but a large majority of the group said, 
this is not going great because we are not getting very much money and we could get a whole lot more if we let this sustain itself. So for me, part of what I'm trying to understand is how people define the actual problem. And so I kind of use that as an indicator. I don't know if that's answering your question exactly. Um, we'll come back to that. I'll let, uh, okay. let Marty, Marty uh, think about that for a minute. So we have a, a, a doozy here from Adam. So this is multi-part um, and, and uh, you may want to pull it up and, and read it along with. So for everyone, how okay. do structural inequities factor into the democratic cooperative process? Structural inequities, okay. Um, equity is one of your needs to be satisfied, but equity is multidimensional and exists along a spectrum as uh, our experience with COVID has highlighted. Yeah. Are there thresholds for equity satisfaction that can allow citizens to cooperate despite the outcomes not being truly equitable? Uh, I think this gets right into your uh, research track here. Yeah, this is the kind of stuff I'm interested in. I would say all of that is an empirical question, but I do think I have some thoughts about that. Um, there's a reason that I wanted to look at polarization and uh, it is because I'm interested in different types of inequities in the process of decision-making and in the outcomes. So you've got the procedural justice aspect and you've got the distributive justice out aspect. And um, I think what you find a lot of times in, especially in complex societies, there's so much stratification on race, class, gender, economics, et cetera. Um, what that's going to do is that's going to structurally make it to where certain classes of people can't get to the table to help make those decisions. And often the more elite folks in the society will systematically make sure that those people can't get to the table. So actually my research first started at looking at participatory democracy processes and trying to understand how to alleviate that and trying to find evidence to demonstrate that, you know, um, when you have that type of inequity, you ultimately end up making less adaptive systems. And over time, I think you will also yield worse outcomes overall. Um, now, the people who are elite can benefit from that in a large way, and they can continue to benefit from that system. But eventually, I think history shows that everyone ends up burning in the flames of that kind of inequity. Um, so some of the work that I've been doing is I've been doing uh, some research on public engagement here in Louisville. Uh, that are Louisville government hosted uh, events. And we looked at all kinds of these things and I measured perceptions of procedural justice, et cetera, usefulness, reasons for coming to public engagement, all these kind of things um, in these. And we were looking at specifically Louisville's West End, which is one of the most segregated, marginalized, predominantly black communities in the United States. It ranks ninth in the United States for this issue. Um, and so I was trying to see what's the history of marginalization here and what are people's perceptions of this? And what we found was that, just to give you one example, um, it, redlining, which is this sort of uh, practice in the 1930s and 40s that was trying to assess the value of communities for loans. And they were using, uh, they were discriminating against blacks and saying, okay, there's a lot of black households in this neighborhood. Therefore, this is a risky neighborhood to give loans to, et cetera, et cetera. And that was a structural inequity. Um, one of the engagement events in Louisville has been a public dialogue about that, saying we recognize this occurred, let's talk about it, let's figure out a way to improve this. One of those events, and these all the events we went to were, were located in the West End to try to get these folks to have an opportunity to participate. And what we found was that usually they weren't there, and usually what was happening is people were traveling even from out of state to come to these meetings, and they were mostly white, affluent people, with high income and they would take over the meetings and make it about themselves. So you see this sort of like elite capture occurring. And so the gist of what I'm trying to say here is that the inequity itself is a barrier to good democratic process and it undermines the design principle, principle for shared decision-making. And to the extent that it does that, it's going to yield uncooperative behavior for those people who are excluded and it's gonna yield a worse process, I think, overall. So it needs to be fundamentally resolved. And then you asked about thresholds. Um, yeah, I do believe there's thresholds there would usually be in any complex system. I don't know exactly what those are yet. People have talked about Gini coefficients for economy, you know, once it reaches a certain threshold, people start to get up in arms about, you know, the economic system. 
I bet there's something like that for this. I don't know what it is. Um, and then the other thing, how to fix this. Uh, I think fundamentally, I talk about this in my papers on this, uh, especially the one about social cognitive biases and adaptation. I think that fundamentally we are not teaching people in the United States anything that matters when it comes to adaptive governance. We need to first teach them that adaptive governance is a thing, that our government is designed to be adaptive. And then we need to teach them everything we can about microeconomics, social cognition, and cognitive psychology. Because we're in a day and age now where people do not understand the basic elements of human cognition, and you cannot govern if you don't understand the things you're trying to govern. That's my opinion. So Adam has one final question with, uh, with this, and that's, um, are the structural inequities internalized as just to allow cooperation to continue? For instance, the myth of the American dream. Based on the way that you're posing these questions, I think you already know the answer, and I agree with what you exactly said there. Um, so there's this process in social psychology that's referred to as system justification theory. And it's precisely what you sort of said there that, for example, people who are more affluent in society who benefit very subtly and sometimes explicitly from the design of everything, they'll get to a point where in their life and they've been successful and they'll are more successful than others. And they'll say, I earned this, I did this. And then if you come to them and say, hey, did you know that maybe you had a lot of this because you were white or whatever, um, as compared to these other people. And then what that'll do is that'll be very threatening to their identity and their fundamental needs. And so what they'll do is they will engage in all kinds of ways to justify and rationalize that system so that they feel better about what happened. And often the way that it'll come out is they'll be blaming the victim or saying that um, the problem's not as big as it really looks. So denying it and so forth. So uh, yeah, I think you're right. And I think what we see right now in society on pretty much all levels is a larger voice for people saying, we really need to pay attention to these inequities. We really need to rethink the system. We can no longer justif justify this. At least there's a battle and a narrative about that to decide what's the system gonna be. Do we stand by the current system? It's an inflection point in adaptation, I think. A window of opportunity is what I'd like to think of it as. We have a... Um, another question here, given the different perspective on the role of gov different perspectives on the role of government, how do you think the your insights might change uh, with a democratic president? Okay, um, I've been very disappointed with uh, presidents across the board period. Uh, and the reason that I've been disappointed with them, even with President Obama, um, for example, which Democrats recently really hail and stuff, um, did not focus enough on the fundamentals of democratic uh, dialogue and engagement. I think there wasn't, hasn't been enough conversation about we, everything in society is a social dilemma. And the fact that social dilemmas will lead people, even people who have the potential to be very cooperative, which I think is a large majority of people, honestly, will lead them to act very selfishly and vilify others if they don't have good norm set, good leadership set, and they don't have proper education in society, et cetera. So um, I think that's, I think no matter who's elected, a president needs to do that. And if they don't, this will not get resolved. The other issue is I think there's a more systemic problem here, which is that, uh, you know, communication is one of the key components of good self-governance in a society and problem solving. And I think with the rise of social media, uh, the rise of news opinions, uh, I think people are using that to substitute for communication where they're no longer really communicating with each other. And they're, it's sort of this unilateral sort of uh, substitute for communication. Yeah, so I think, that, I think that news media has a really, really big role to play in this. And I think it's very guilty uh, honestly, I, whether it's liberal news or conservative, I think a lot of times they're playing for splashy points rather than trying to truly inform and uh, give people information that they can have a dialogue about. On that note, um, this has been a wonderful uh, discussion, Dan. Your work is super interesting and uh, uh, so, so topical. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time uh, to join us today.
I think we've all enjoyed the discussion very much and we hope we can do it again very soon. Thanks everyone for, yeah, thank you. for joining with us. Yeah, thanks for this opportunity. And anybody that wants to reach out and talk more about this or, or share work or whatever, please feel free to contact me. Great. Thanks all.